Tonight, standoff in negotiations between independent power producers and government. As the finance ministry insists, the IPPs must take a haircut or risk not being paid. Well, we've made an offer to them to accept a haircut. Where's the money? We have to raise the money together. And they, has, they have to understand that we have to raise the money to be able to pay them. We have the latest as fresh disputes emerge over how much exactly the IPPs are owed by the state. It's not good for people to bandy figures around. And just because you have the platform, you mention any figure thinking that you will win the sympathies of people. It's not $2.3 billion. So will the power producers shut down their plans as earlier threatened? We have details. This is Top Story with Evans Mensah. And Top Story is always brought to you by Vodafone. It is now a full-blown standoff, pitching independent power producers firmly against the government over hugely accumulated debt. Now, the Finance Ministry has confirmed to join us the IPPs must now accept a haircut on what they are owed or risk not being paid at all. In fact, a fresh dispute has also erupted over the exact amount owed to the IPPs. Now, the power producers had insisted they are owed $2.3 billion and declared they will not accept any form of debt restructuring. Now, listen to the CEO of the Chamber of Independent Power Producers, Alec Blema Petobo. Uh, I think our engagement is not about debt restructuring. Uh, it's about a discussion in relation to how uh, government should settle our arrest and how, what solution do you have for the current invoices going forward? As well as uh, renegotiation of some terms of our power purchase agreement. So are you have you agreed to restructure the arrears, the debt that you owed? We, we've made our position known emphatically regarding the debt restructuring that we are not open to that. We are open to a discussion discussing uh, the payment plan of our arrears. You know, when we are talking about debt restructuring, uh, it's a question of what do you want to restructure? We have made our position known that our arrears in questions relates the cost of our services. And also we indicated that our arrears are actually obligations that we have owed to our stakeholder, particularly the lenders. Again, suggesting that implies that IPPs have some free cash flow over there for which we are pressing them to accept a debt restructure, which is actually not the case. Mm. So for debt restructuring, we are sure, I'm sure to tell you that it's not a position in the IPPs to accept. Well, on PM Express last night, the Minister of State at the Finance Ministry, Dr. Mohamed Amin Adam, who has been leading the government negotiations, declared there cannot be any compromise of a government determination to restructure the debt. He says the power producers must take a haircut. That is not uh, the reality on the ground. I mean, maybe he should explain the kind of restructuring. They said, no, no. Because as I speak to you, there have been proposals or restructuring presented, from government yeah, to them. No, presented also by IPPs. What we offered to them is different from what they offered to us. They actually sent us a counter offer, you know. So if they don't agree to our offer for restructuring, uh, what they have presented to us is also an offer for restructuring. It's just that there is no uh, consensus on what kind of restructuring we need to do. But restructuring takes different, different forms. It says what they agree to, yeah. what they are prepared to tolerate, yeah. is a payment plan. But not restructuring the sense where they will get a haircut. Oh, so if he's talking about haircut, uh, maybe he should speak for his company. I appreciate that he is the, uh, the, CEO, of the, the CEO of the chamber. But you know that ECG has contract with individual IPPs. Yeah. 
and ECG is engaged in discussions with the individual IPPs. So some understanding has been reached. The negotiation is continuing. And so sometimes I, I get worried when the chamber speaks, you know, for all the IPPs, knowing that the individual IPPs have been having discussions with ECG that the chamber as an executive may not be privy to. And so as far as I'm concerned, I don't want to divulge what is being negotiated, but I can tell you that some restructuring is going to happen. It may not be the kind of restructuring they want, but until we conclude the negotiation, uh, we are not able to tell what we have restructured. Broad strokes, uh, are you suggesting, like we've seen in the restructuring that has been done so far, some form of a haircut? Well, we've made an offer to them to accept the haircut. We've also asked for them to allow us to spread you know, the debt over uh, some uh, time. $2.3 million. $2.3 million. Billion. No, billion dollars, in fact, which is also you know, contested because the entire energy sector debt is now up to 2.3, not to talk of IPP. As of the end of uh, last year, the debt that we you know, were able to calculate was about $1.7 billion dollars and of which $450 million was for fuel, which is not for IPPs. And you know our fuel suppliers like Sankofa, Nigeria, uh, Jubilee, you know. And so IPP was about 1.1, 1.2. So when did that rise? Within five months to $2.3 billion. So that cannot be accepted. So use that. And, I thought and, you did an audit, and that's clear. No, the audit was up to 2021. We are currently doing the audit. And the audit that is currently happening is revealing that the debt may even be less than, for IPP, less than $1 billion. So when we finalize the audit, the figures will come out. And so it is not good for people to bandy figures around. And just because you have the platform, you mentioned any figure thinking that it will win the sympathies of uh, people. It's not $2.3 billion. As, as I can tell you for a fact. The, yes. the, the haircuts that you're intending to, uh -huh. I guess, uh, negotiate mm. with the IPPs, how much haircut are you going to get? I well, I think we, we made an offer. Like proposing. But, I mean, this is a negotiation between us and the mm. IPPs, and I don't think I should discuss... Uh, the terms of 10 percent, five percent. I don't think it's fair to the IPPs. I don't think okay. it's fair to the IPPs. But definitely, that was that. No, no, no. But, <laughs> no, but I don't good. think it's fair to the IPPs. <laughs> if I start talking about what we offer them. But why is government imposing a haircut on power already consumed? That's a question I put to the Minister of State at the Finance Ministry. Oh, but how about the DDEP? We're saying that the people... Well, the same had, arguments came no, up. No, the people who had the bonds... The we've done questions. that to you. We've done that to myself. I don't know about Atu if he had the bonds. And Ghanaians accepted this challenge. They sacrificed so much. And we thank them for that sacrifice. We are doing the same thing to our external you know, creditors. So how about IPPs? What makes IPP so unique that you know, we cannot apply the principle to them? In our case, because you told everybody us... Everybody that we have applied the principle to has done something for us. Some have bought our bonds. Some have provided services. Some have given us loans to undertake government projects. So the principle is the principle. And we are very happy that a lot have responded positively, particularly IPPs? the people of Ghana. Okay, the people and of Ghana. I, and I expect IPPs to also respond positively. Anyway. Okay. And if they don't, in, in our case, you told us if we don't accept it, you, 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 you won't be able to pay. <laughs> in the IPPs case. It's the same. Okay. It's the same. Where's the money? We have to raise the money together. And they, has, they have to understand that we have to raise the money to be yeah, able yeah. to pay them. Well, thankfully, uh, the CEO of the Chamber of IPPs just joined me on the telephone line right now. He is Alec Pinma Petogbo. Thank you very much, Alec Pinma, for your time here on Top Story. Thank you very much, Ivan. You heard the Minister of State at the Finance Ministry. He asked a question I want to put to you. He says, what makes IPP so unique that you should not take a haircut like everyone else? Thank you very much. Uh, it shakes or surprises me uh, when he made that comment. This is somewhat business capital. We are not lenders to government. We are talking about cost of service that we have rendered. I will simply describe the comment 
as that of uh, an interference from a politician in a private business. You know, our business of power generation is a private investment funded by private equity and debt, and not a publicly funded, uh, uh, publicly funded. So you cannot make such a comment. Why should a private man pay for somebody's recklessness in expenditure? And we have stated the reason for which we cannot accept that offer of debt restructuring. We made mention of what we are owed to our lenders. We do not have that kind of luxury to go and negotiate with our financiers what uh, challenges the investment economy is going through. No, it doesn't work like that with us. Well, we look to understand this simple uh, analogy. So uh, I'm disappointed by that comment anyway. But he's clear, though that you either accept the haircut or you risk not being paid at all. In fact, he says, there is simply no money. <laughs> well, uh, all that I can say is that I wish him well uh, in, 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 that posture, in that position. You know, our business of power generation is bonded by fairly negotiated risk-sharing documents called power purchase agreement. Fairly negotiated, and it is about risk-sharing. Everybody has taken cover of the risk involved in the business. This afternoon, somebody just shared a report with me from the Auditor General that a ECG is unable to account for some money that they have collected. Look at the arrears. ECG has over 7 million customers and unable to co- uh, account for only 3 million. Many over four, about 4 million are using electricity for free. Why won't you be concerned? about dealing with this issue internally before coming out of our proposal in the negotiating table. Let's be fair to ourselves. We must take it as a case study and get it to work. And when it works, the whole sector, the whole value chain will work. Well, Mr. Ameta, well, you've heard the uh, Minister of State. And from what I understand, he's, been, he's the man who's leading the negotiations with you. And with the, you're already engaging some of your members. He says... Some of your members are actually making counter offers, bordering on restructuring already. And now you may not know because they are engaging individually at that level. Well, I indicated that we share real time information among ourselves. But the underlying factor is that we are not accepting a restructure of our areas or haircuts on our areas as their obligations already owed. Stay with me, because there's a subject around how much government owes you, which is also now a subject of controversy tonight, as you had the Minister of State articulate in that interview with me on PM Express. I want to bring in the ranking on the Mind and Energy Committee in Parliament. He's also a member on the Finance Committee, John Janapo. Mr. Janapo, thanks for your time uh, here on Top Story. You, you had the uh, Minister of State at the Finance Ministry. The government is very clear on this matter. As far as the arrears are concerned, the IPPs must accept a haircut. You've heard the IPP say that's not something they can tolerate. But government is in a place where they simply cannot afford to pay all what they owe. And a haircut is what they're proposing. And then the, the, the view there is everybody else is accepting a haircut. Individuals did accept a haircut. Banks did accept a haircut. Why not the IPPs? First of all, it's very unfortunate that trust, cooperation, and confidence between governments and these IPPs have broken down. In this, this sense, a very, very worrying signal internationally. What this does is that would-be investors and potential investors would view government, for that matter, Ghana, as a hostile investment destination. What the finance ministry has done is simply to put a gun to the head of the IPP and say, take it or pack and leave. Because if they do not take it, it means that they won't pay them. And if they do not pay them, it means that their financiers will begin to call on some of the guarantees. And once they begin to call on the guarantees, it means that the whole contractual framework is broken down. This is very, very alarming. This is worrying. And this has the potential of destabilizing the entire power system in Ghana. I thought that government would have shown good faith. First of all, the IPPs have not advanced 
bonds in the sense of buying government bonds. The IPPs are just as contractors in Ghana who have provided services. My worry is that from the IPPs, government is likely then to extend it to other contractors who have provided services for the state. Because there's no difference between those who have provided services like goods and services and these IPPs. And I thought that government would have demonstrated some good faith, exercised some level of maturity, and some level of restraint. I was very, very disappointed hearing what the minister stated on your program. But, but he's, he's just articulating the reality. The money is simply not there. That's what I'm saying. That the minister is virtually putting a gun on the head of the IPP and telling them that accept it or pack up. And I will not be surprised if in the coming days some of the guarantees are called upon. Which further exacerbates this country's reputation? We've suffered enough. But more importantly, after the minister is confirming that the figures they've been putting out all this while are inaccurate. In fact, if you go to the budget, and I'm just referring to the main budget, not the speech, because the speech is just an average version. Page 23, paragraph 120. Mr. Speaker, government has also started constructive engagement with individual IPPs to restructure their areas, amounting to one point. 7 billion after the end of May 2023. Yesterday, the minister told you that even that figure, they can't stand by it. And that is far less than this figure. So the very budget you present to parliament, you yourself, you are quoting 1.7 billion. And then you go and sit on an important platform such as yours and say that even those figures, you cannot vouch for them. And that you are going to do a certain audit. They did not even say estimated. They were categorical. And all this while they kept accusing all of us that they are paying so much. So how did they come by those payments and how did they validate those amounts before paying? I'm very, very worried. It does appear that this government is taking a knee-jerk approach, a firefighting approach, rather than looking at it from a comprehensive point of view. They set up the energy sector recovery program. It's a lapse. And yet nothing can be shown for that. They can't even tell us the contracts they renegotiated. This is most, most unfortunate. And I'm really, really worried as a sector player. On the subject of how much exactly they, they owe the IPPs, let me bring in Elik Pulim. Elik Pulim, the, uh, the Minister of State at the Finance Ministry is clear that it is definitely not $2.3 billion, as you articulated yesterday in my interview with you, and that it is $1.1 uh, billion dollars and then that even that the audit that they're currently uh, undertaking is revealing that it could be less even uh i would appreciate if you could provide clarifications on his position let me say that we do not do political accounting or color our books to please anyone we are experts in our business you know, accounting for power goes beyond the normal addition of receipts of invoice and the payments that you have made. During our engagement with the IMF, IMF told us sadly that government of Ghana is unable to produce a single figure of total indebtedness to the sector. And we took time to make revelations on how the figures look like to IMF. And IMF is fully aware, backed by information valid information you know when you take a typical power purchase agreement you know you have got to submit to your off-taker on monthly basis as invoice aside that there are other claims in the ppa that also result in financial liability that you also account for and we take a typical tariff you are looking at your energy charge and capital recovery charge so I do not know what kind of uh, analysis that he, uh, he did to come out with that kind of uh, position. But I, 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 can, let, 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 let me let, let me explain this. You can also do a verification from the from the grid, check the availability of the power producers. How much are they able to put on the grid daily? How much are they putting on the grid monthly? Then do some analysis do a, a, a rough calculation by multiplying by average tariff and see what figures are involved. 
He may talk about four components that are uh, four that are supplied to the entity. Let me make it clear that the four supply agreements are owned by the power producers, not government. If they come out with a proposal to say that, well, now I will take responsibility of the four components of the generation, that is fine. But until you settle it, I must recognize those figures in my book as liability I have to pay. And it forms part of the invoices that I give to you. Yeah, Eliplem, clarity. Four months ago when this conversation started, it was stated that you were owed just a little over a billion dollars. I remember speaking to the uh, ECG boss and confirming that. Yourself actually did confirm, saying, how did it become $2.3 billion in, in four months? I mentioned to you what I can't for. Their position is always different from our position. But four they months may, ago, four, four, four months ago, what they were quoting? The that we are giving them I mean, and the payments that we have. The point uh, I'm making is they have made to us. Four months ago, the figures they keep uh, carrying a, 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 around. Yeah, but Elikpen, four months ago, they are positioning on how much they owe you, aligned with yours. When did this change in the last four months? Last four months, we are talking about uh, uh, which month specifically? As in March. I, I recall very correctly. Uh, in March, when I spoke to the ECG boss, he mentioned they owe you just over a billion. And you agreed that was the amount? I don't think so. In March, I think our position was about $1.4 uh, billion. US dollars. Okay, so $1.4 billion. So in March, April, May, June, July, you say now you're in excess of what? You're now... Currently talking about two point three billion. How did that jump to that amount? That's what the minister is questioning. As that, as that may, even our position is about one point six. And I said that to check this figure, I would direct you that check the availability. How much power that is generated will inform you about how much money that the activities have accrued. But since March, though, what you are actually stating is. Government has accumulated nine hundred million dollars since March, because if it was one point four billion in March, March to now, just a, just a little over four months more, it's now six hundred. Uh, nine hundred billion, nine hundred million more, is that even realistic? That's what government is questioning. That that, that should depend on the kind of balance that uh, the balance that we are working with. I indicated how they do their accounting and report to the public. So when you come to my books, I talk, I, I, I talk to you about reality. So all the justification they will provide is oh, the figures that I mentioned are in context and require uh, audit, which is never ending. What are you going to do now, considering what you've heard from the finance ministry? In regards to which, which of the cases, is it a, well, I mean uh, both. I mean they, they they dispute how much they owe you. Secondly, they insist that you must take a haircut. That that that, that is that is that is normal for any debtor to do to say uh, they, they are contested. I can uh, definitely paid by a certain date. You don't have a choice then to shut down the machines. I mean intervention, and we have shown good account improvement. So I think uh, once we, we have something to work with, we'll continue to work. But, but that what you're referring to is remaining remaining current. The, your current invoices, exactly. your current exactly. invoices you're submitting. We are now talking about the arrears. That's what government says. You have to take a haircut on. I'm, I'm saying on that particular and, bit. What's and, your and, position? And, what and you that haircut will not will, will not happen. Mr. Junapo, we, so we, we, we can discuss Hello. how uh, it can be repeated. Well, Mr. Jampo, you see a standoff here clearly. Government position is, is very clear. The opposition is also clear on the arrears. Um, will the your committee stepping at some point? You did to avert that last threat of a shutdown. Now you're hearing echoes of that returning. What's the plan now? The parliament is to step in. We have to step in to even as it's in the veracity of all these figures they are putting out. Government itself comes to present a figure before parliament. Parliament. Not any house, parliament. And then less than 24 hours, the minister of state, under whose watch this budget was presented, says that even the 1.7 they presented is inaccurate. And that it is 1.1. 1. 1. 
should be worrying. And even that 1.1, 1. 1, he is not sure. There ought to be some validation. So government doesn't even know how much it owes. If you don't know how much you owe, how do you propose a haircut? A haircut on what amount? To save how much? I mean, this should be worrying. Any ordinary Ghanaian, any concerned Ghanaian, ought to be very, very worried at the, at the demonstration of complete incompetence because at least you are buying the power. The bills come to you, you have to vet them. So since 2017 to date, all these years, you've not verified the invoices that have been submitted to you. And that is only yesterday you realized that the invoices are inaccurate. Something has been wrong somewhere, Ivan. I'm very, very worried as a member of parliament. And I think that this even goes beyond parliament. A government that can't produce accurate figures of its indebtedness. Wow. We are indeed in real serious trouble. Mr. Junapo, thank you very much. Uh, Eli Krimah Petogbo as well. I'm, I'm grateful. Um, this conversation is one that is uh, continuing. The negotiations are still continuing. You've heard the both sides and what their positions are on the matter. Uh, we will bring you the very latest as and when we learn more. This is Top Story News Night in a minute. Hey, you ever buy credits where you get up to 20% of your money back before? <laughs> Make I tell you about Vodafone's a double promo. See, anytime you the rich has a double, you get up to 20%, whether it be short code or your Vodafone cash wallet, or you don't use credit transfer to your number or someone else. And now you be high tech, so you don't use my Vodafone app or any payment app. Ta -e -dum. However, you do um. Vodafone go send you up to 20% cash back. Ta -e -dum. Into your Vodafone cash account. Uri Lodi, yeah. But then he enter. Top up your airtime with five Ghana CD or more in Vodafone's a double promo. And receive 20% of your money back straight into your Vodafone cash wallet. Recharge and cash out in the Vodafone Air Demo promotion. Vodafone, further together. I've got the back and I won't let go. My name is Nanama McBrown. Many people think I get what I want anytime because I am popular. <laughs> no, that is not true. It is because me and Kasano, I like the best. And when I find it, I stick to it. I have found Bell Pack T Roll and I'm stuck with it. It is soft but not weak, strong but not hard. It is just perfect. Bell Pack T Roll is smooth and gentle on the skin. Same as Bell Pack Kitchen Towel. It cleans in one wipe. You can soak, squeeze, and clean again. One Bell Pack Kitchen Towel lasts longer and saves you money. It's time you switch to Bell Pack today and experience the perfect paper tissue. Say your pocket tissue, table napkins, tea roll, and a kitchen towel. Bell Pack is simply the best. Bell Pack, just perfect. To be a Bell Pack distributor, call 055 Another quality product from Bell Aqua. Nothing feels so good like Bell Pack. In the next 60 minutes here on Newsnight, Ghana AIDS Commission in a frantic search for more than 100,000 persons carrying HIV in Ghana but are unaware and spreading to unsuspecting public through sex. That represents about 100,000 people. You mean all of these are out there, they don't know they have HIV and may be spreading? Exactly. That is what is happening. And of course, they are spreading it unknowingly. Details, as the commission says, it is concerned about the high number of women who are now unashamedly engaged in unprotected sex with multiple partners. When you go out there, you see young people, even some at the tender age of 10, soliciting on the internet and so you have hook up where a young lady will, will go to a client at an agreed place also tonight 
government on collusion costs with organized labor as it appeals to unions to accept haircuts on pension funds in the latest round of domestic debt exchange. But uh, many other Ghanaians sacrificed and participated, and they have contributed gallantly. It's just some of the pension funds to take up the economy. Offer. You know, so we encourage them. I encourage them to okay. take the offer. Also tonight, Auditor General reveals nationwide shortage of essential medicines for treating mental health cases as central medical stores struggle to meet demand for psychotropic drugs. It's quite frustrating, especially during the night when they try to follow you. There's going to be a redevelopment on the Accra Psychiatric Hospital premises. All things were in place, but it's told. And in business, more oil marketing firms, increased prices of petroleum products, are the pumps a development that could influence commercial drivers' demand for adjustment in fares. And in sports, we hear from Black Stars head coach Chris Eaton, who's been stressing on why the Black Stars cannot afford to miss out on AFCON 2023. All your views here on News Night 055 My name is Evans Mensa. And we start tonight with a startling revelation uh, from the Ghana AIDS Commission. And the commission says tonight that there are more than 100,000 persons carrying HIV but are unaware and spreading it across the country. Now, this is according to the Director General of the Commission, who says the commission has mounted an aggressive search for these persons to bring them under treatment. He made the revelations in an interview with John Issy's head of health, the health desk, Fred Smith, shortly after announcing the country's latest HIV figures at a news conference in Accra. We'll bring you that interview shortly. But first, though, uh, Fred Smith joins me in the studio with more on this development. Let's start, Fred, from the general situation as captured in the 2022 national and sub national HIV estimates and projections. Well, Evans, uh, let's start from the general situation as captured in the 2022 national and subnational HIV estimates and projections. And here, uh, they indicate that the data released is for the period 2022 and not for 2023. It is, however, uh, the very latest we have on this situation. They found that nearly 16,000 persons contracted the virus in Ghana. And that's a decline if you compare that to events in 2021. But the commission is happy about that. I will explain to you when we hear from the Director General of the Ghana AIDS Commission. In 2022, yeah, so the, the HIV, adult HIV prevalence was 1.66%. And the number of people living with HIV in the country was about 355,000, made up of 115,235 males and 239,692 females, which suggests that uh, females are about twice the number of male HIV population in the country. And that underscores an important vulnerability of females that we all have to avert our minds to. In terms of uh, age disaggregation, children age 0 to 14 who principally may have contracted HIV through vertical transmission were about 24,712. And adults that is 15, age 15 years and above, being 330,215. Fred, from what I understand from this data, uh, the HIV population in Ghana has, has inched up. But the, yeah. the commission is, is not bothered by that, is it? Yeah, they're actually happy about this because they, they explain that a lot more people are depending on the antiretrovirals. And it is actually 
becoming more effective. And so persons who had HIV a very long time ago are still alive. They are living longer than they used to do. And so we have all of these persons still around adding to the numbers. And that's how come we have uh, an increase in the national population. And the more you take the HRVs, the, the, the viral load goes down, and so that then leads to less infections across the board. Uh, let, let's talk about the, the scary figures you learned from him uh, post the presentation when you sat down with him. There's a 100,000 number of individuals who are out there carrying the virus but not knowing that they have it and spreading it actively. Yeah, so the data showed, and, and this is also to look at those who have the virus but have not come forward to test or maybe are unaware that they have it. And according to the data they provided, uh, nearly 100,000 persons have the virus but they haven't been able to test or have not been to a facility to be assessed for this. And these are the persons the commission believes are spreading the virus and they are actually looking for them. I asked the Director General about this situation. Uh, more than 28% of people living with HIV still do not know their HIV status because they have not tested. And uh, more than 28%? Yes. Uh, that represents what number? That represents about 100,000 people. 100,000 people. Yes. You mean all of these are out there, they don't know they have HIV and may be spreading? Exactly. That is what is happening. And of course, they are spreading it unknowingly. And that is not the best. And in fact, uh, the, if, if, if someone is important for everyone to know their HIV status, and knowing it early, you know, is very important, even for treatment success. Uh, if you wait till you, you get AIDS before you go to hospital, it will take a longer, much longer time for you to recover in terms of boosting your immune system for, for it to, you know, regenerate and support your body. It takes longer time. And, and so it is important that you get tested to know your HIV status when you are strong and well. And briefly, are you looking, are you on the search for all of these 100,000 people? Yes, we are. That is why we launched the self-test campaign uh, two weeks ago. Because there are people who are underserved when it comes to HIV services. Uh, some are hard to reach uh, and they may not have the opportunity to get the, any of the services. And so bringing testing to their doorsteps and test the self-test kits are being distributed in the communities. So bringing it to their do doorsteps will enable those who fear to know their status to at least start the process by testing to see whether they are reactive or non-reactive. Fred, what's the forecast uh, as far as this year is concerned? Yeah, so they've started collecting data for this year already, and they anticipate that new infections will decline, but again, will have an increase in the number of persons who have HIV and AIDS in Ghana next year. So, looking at 2023 uh, outlook, that is what we anticipate based on the 2022. Uh, data. What we anticipate the projections for 2023 might be is what you see in this slide, which shows that an estimated 357,915 uh, HIV population uh, would be what the numbers will, uh, will be for 2023. So which means that in 2023, we expect the HIV population numbers to increase slightly uh, of almost about 2,000 or thereabout. And then new infections, new infections will reduce to about 13,600 
And we'll get a bit more detail also uh, on what this means for the projection to, to eliminate HIV and AIDS in Ghana by 2030, 2030. Uh, from the uh, board of, from the boss of the AIDS Commission pretty shortly. But also, Fred, today, uh, this uh, revelation from the uh, press briefing about young women, a number of women who are now uh, engaged in unprotected access, appearing to push the numbers up, especially among women. Yes, indeed. The Director General for the Ghana AIDS Commission spent a lot of time highlighting how women uh, have become so vulnerable to this, about twice the number of women who have, uh, the men who have HIV, we have that for women. Mm -hmm. And so if you have 100 for men, there will be 200 women who also have uh, HIV, and that's not encouraging at all. The Director General uh, uh, believes that a lot of women are now having unprotected sex, sex with multiple partners, and he thinks that this is causing an increase in the spread amongst women in Ghana. Okay. Uh, thank you, my friend. Uh, thankfully, uh, he joins us on the telephone line right now. Dr. Chairman Tiahene is the Director General of the Ghana AIDS Commission. Uh, Dr. Tiahene, thanks for your time here on News Night. I, I want to start with the 100,000 individuals currently walking about not knowing that they have HIV AIDS and spreading it. Uh, uh, because they are simply ignorant of this. Do we know why people, in spite, and I've heard you do a lot of promotions recently, even here on on the multimedia channels, why are people still not coming forward to test and know their status? Yeah, thank you for having me. Um, first of all, uh, many people fear to know their HIV status because they still have it at the back of their minds that when one gets HIV, it means that person is going to die by all means. And that is uh, uh, a fallacy because now we have treatment for HIV which actually prolongs the lives of uh, persons living with HIV. And they can have, you know, their normal... Uh, Life yeah, as given by God, and so th th that notion has to change. The other one is uh, the other reason is primarily because of uh, stigma and discrimination related to HIV. Many people who have HIV wouldn't want others to know because they think that uh, uh, they would end up being stigmatized, and that prevent people from accessing testing, uh, treatment and care services, uh, even though these services are widely available throughout the country. And so if we want more and more people to test, then we have to reduce stigma. We have to accept HIV as, as a fact of life in this country, and that it is something we all have to um, acknowledge and uh, appreciate and support those who live with HIV. And the, the last point I would like to raise is the fact that many people may want to test, but probably their access to the service may be limited because there are under self population uh, due to where they live. Um, if they live in remote areas, how to reach areas, then it will be difficult for them to test and know their HIV status. And as you know, HIV is spread throughout this country. Every community has a person living with HIV. So it doesn't matter how remote uh, the residence of people might be. Uh, they still could be having HIV uh, persons, uh, persons living with HIV in such remote communities. And the access to testing may be limited. Uh, and, and so these are some of the reasons. Of the, of the reasons. In 100,000 people, that's a significantly huge number there. It's safe to assume from the breakdown you gave us today that majority of this number will be women? I would suspect majority will rather be men because uh, less number of men are testing compared to women. Although in the general population of those with HIV AIDS, you found out that there are twice as many women compared to men. Yes, that, that is the general situation, and it's not peculiar to Ghana. It's uh, a situation that actually uh, reflects 
any generalized epidemic like ours. And so it is nothing new. Uh, and But the fact also based on the data is that, you know, majority of men living with HIV may not know their HIV status. And that is concerning. And men have to take the bold step and, and test for HIV. But, but what, what you say is actually also very alarming then, because then what it means is that out of this 100,000, if the majority of them are men, then it, it means that those spreading this unknowingly, majority of them spreading this, will be men spreading it and possibly giving it to women. Yes. And you say you, you are you are correct to say that. And I and I guess if a woman you're listening, be warned there because the, you know and 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 linked to that is your other revelation that women are now engaged in unprotected sex with multiple partners. Another headache of yours. Yes, and I think it should it should be a shared headache of all Ghanaians because we we know that women have. You know, biological vulnerabilities when it comes to uh, uh, HIV and other sexually transmitted infections. And it is the responsibility of women and their partners, you know, to ensure that uh, women are protected. Uh, but unfortunately, the male partners often are the ones who will even insist on not using protection. And here I mean use of condom. Um, uh, because they would uh, always say that, are you suspecting I have a, a disease? And so you wouldn't want me to have, uh, you know, sex with you without a use of condom. So all these, you know, uh, pose serious challenges to women, even when they are uh, amenable to using condoms. But we are sitting on a ticking time bomb here because from everything you've analyzed now, you have more men walking about right now with HIV AIDS that they don't know they have and therefore spreading. And then you have more women now, as you now discovering, who are engaging in unprotected sex with multiple partners. Of course, multiple partners being men. The men, many of them who are walking about with AIDS, they don't know. That is, that is a recipe for disaster. Yes. Uh, uh, and there are various, I uh, mean, practices when it comes to sex in, in Ghana now um, because people are exposed to all kinds of media materials uh, and they would want to experiment. And so you have people who engage in oggy ses sessions. You have people who are uh, more interested in having inner sex. For example, um, having a lot of alcoholic drinks or uh, other illicit drugs before having sex, uh, trying all kinds of things, you know. So all these increase the, the risk of one getting HIV. And I, I believe if we all acknowledge that, yes, you want to have pleasure, yes, you want to enjoy yourself, um, do it in moderation and put set some boundaries for yourself because HIV is real and is still infecting people in this country. Uh, two weeks ago, I mentioned that uh, about 46 people get infected daily in this country. And so it is real. And people are dying of AIDS when at, at the time when we do not have to have people having disease progression and dying, you know, subsequently because of uh, AIDS-related, you know, diseases. Uh, and so we have to, you know, now recognize that we are all being complacent when it comes to HIV, and we need to change that, uh, that mindset and change our behaviors as well. And, and what does this more protective behaviors? Yeah. So that we can uh, reduce new infections to, you know, uh, bearers, bring it to the bearers. The, the projection is to eradicate this by 2030. Um, where, where does this all leave us with that particular projection? Yes. Are As we on I course? Are we on course? We have, 
we have the strategies and the tools to uh, el- eliminate AIDS by the by the year 2030. But if we continue the way if the level of uh, risky behaviors continue as it is today, and that we have the high levels of new infections as we are seeing today, uh, and if we do not have the necessary resources to actually make the investment uh, in areas where we, uh, to ensure that we are able to provide the necessary services for those who need the services, then we cannot achieve the 2030 target. Thank you very much. And that's uh, Dr. Tremetian Hini, the Director General of the Ghana AIDS Commission. So live your news night is on Joy 99.7 FM. Now, government is tonight on a collision course with organized labor after making a massive U-turn on its earlier position to exclude pension funds from the domestic debt exchange program. Now, last night, the finance ministry formally asked pension funds to exchange 31 billion CDs for lower yielding bonds and take a haircut on investments. Organized Labour has called an emergency meeting on the matter. We have details of that shortly, but first listen to Minister of State at the Finance Ministry, uh, Dr. Mohammed Amin Adam. Uh, we'll hear that uh, from him pretty shortly, but also today uh, we've been hearing uh, from uh, Organized Labour on the uh, on, on the proposal uh, before them for them uh, to exchange uh, some 31 uh, billion uh, CDs uh, in bonds that has already uh, been been issued by the pension uh, funds. The organized labor, from what we understand, uh, led by the TUC, they've called this uh, emergency meeting on Thursday to take a united uh, position on the matter. Uh, and, and that, they believe, will then set the stage for uh, further negotiations with, with government. Uh, we'll hear from the, from the union shortly, but this is Dr. Mohamed Amin Adam. Well, um, government has made the offer, so they have to decide. And, uh, but you've rejected the settlement. Prior, you excluded yeah. them. You exempted them. Well, but I, I think you also recall that we had mm. an MOU uh, with Labour uh, on which we agreed to continue to engage uh, for an alternative uh, option that will help in the improving on the uh, debt sustainability. And so it's within this uh, engagement that uh, we think that this is the time to, to make that This possible. is voluntary, right? Yeah. This is voluntary. Yeah, yeah. If they decide not to, yeah. not we'll, to exchange. We'll continue to engage. I mean, after all, some of you didn't participate in the DDEP, but uh, many other Ghanaians sacrificed and participated, and they have contributed gallantly so to, you the expect recovery, some of the pension to the funds. economic recovery. You expect some of the pension funds to take up the, the offer. economy. You know, so we encourage them. I encourage them to okay. take the offer. Uh, Joshua Ansai is the Deputy uh, Secretary General of the TUC, the Trade Union Congress, and joins us on the line right now. Uh, Ms. Ansan, thanks for your time here on Newsnight. You just heard the Minister of State at the Finance Ministry say, yeah, yeah, they had an agreement, but there was a provision in there to explore alternative arrangement. This is it. You agree that this is a, a fair deal for you to consider? Hey. Yes, sir. Please, can you come again? Because I was, I was, was very long. Yes, I, I can hear you at least. If you can, can you hear me now? So I've just left yes, the can room. You, can you hear me now? And I'm finding a... Can you hear me, sir? Yes, I cannot hear you back. Is it a fair deal, uh, what government is offering now, uh, for the pension funds to uh, exchange 31 billion of bonds that they have already uh, are holding and have invested with the government? Evans, good evening. Thank you for the opportunity. Evans, let me tell you, to be frank with you, um, this uh, memorandum, new exchange memorandum, was launched yesterday by the finance minister. And what we intend doing is that we want to have a copy of the new exchange memorandum. You will study it, and finally, organized labor will take a decision or a position on that. I understand this meeting has been scheduled for Thursday? Yeah, Thursday. We are, we are starting a meeting on Thursday. Have you had any conversation with your pension funds who manage the funds on your behalf? I think when we have the copy of the exchange memorandum, uh, it will be part of our discussions. After we have studied it, we will have further meetings with our uh, uh, trustees and the corporate body so that we can have a positive position on whatever it is. 
I recall very closely, uh, very clearly, when the negotiations happened and there was a press conference yourself, your your boss was seated with the employment minister and the finance minister and you signed this. At the time that you were signing this, um, mm. you were you were very clear then that there was this would not be entertained under any circumstance. Do you uh, at, at least accept that where we are right now, the circumstances may have changed to the point where you should be considering uh, participating in the DDP? It's, 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 I think uh, I want to be very careful in making any statement here for now because uh, a whole organized labor made, and made that decision and they made it very frankly that they were not going to allow their pension funds to be used for this exchange program. I mean, it has, time has elapsed, and then maybe if things have now changed, if the new exchange memorandum is going to be something positive, that will be positive on the pensions and earnings of members. I think uh, you, will, you, will, you will have to study the, the document, look at the pros and the cons, if it is positive, why not? Why don't you have a different position on that again? But for now, as I've said, I have not studied the document, so I cannot say much on the document until Thursday when we meet. You will meet, look at it, discuss it, and also meet with our uh, fund managers and so on and so forth. Then we can come out with a holistic position on that. Okay. Uh, that's uh, Joshua Ansa. He's a Deputy Secretary General of the Trade Union Congress. But where do you stand on the matter if you're a public sector worker? Uh, do you agree? Uh, will you be encouraging your pension funds to participate in the domestic debt exchange involving the funds themselves? 31 billion uh, CDs on offer as the government is hoping to exchange uh, that uh, for uh, lower yielding bonds. So live here on News Night is on Joy 99. Point seven FM. Now, the Auditor General uh, has revealed a nationwide shortage of essential medicines for treating mental health cases. In the Auditor General's 2022 report on mental health management, he indicated that the central medical stores, which is responsible for supplying psychotropic drugs, has been struggling to meet the demand from psychiatric hospitals. Before we bring you details of the Auditor General's report, my colleague Hanno Dami has been exploring the challenge that many uh, health and, uh, the mental health institutions in this country have been facing. Uh, listen to Minds on the Street, a special feature that she developed. Sometimes I feel very bad because some are very young and some too, they are not clothing well, so you feel bad about it. It is not only about how they feel, but the pain they can also inflict on anyone they come by. In August 2022, a mentally challenged woman hit a man with stones at this particular spot. For those who stay and live around, it was a moment of reawakening. For how long are they going to tolerate or look over their shoulders when they see a mentally challenged person in their vicinity? That torturous incident lingers on, on the minds of many who heard it, but most especially on the minds of those who witnessed that horrific act. The thought of being attacked by a mentally challenged person is an act no one would want to experience. Sometimes they come towards you whilst you are walking and you are a little scared, especially during the night. And when you try to, they try to follow you. It is something which is really, you know, uncomfortable. And I feel the government should, in a way, try to put them together in one place. That intervention was on March 2022 by the then medical director of the Accra Psychiatric Hospital, Dr. Pinaman Apau. She revealed the redevelopment of the facility into a 220-bed hospital was under government's Agenda 111 program. Updates that I got from the coordinator of the Agenda 111 project indicates that they are doing what we call technical evaluation on tenders that had been submitted. But almost a year on, not much has happened in terms of a pull-down and a fixed lift. Former director of the Accra Psychiatric Hospital, Dr. Akwisio Seig, delsing on this development. As at the time the idea came to pull down the structures and build new ones, we had got to the point where it didn't seem fitting for a facility of our age in Ghana. All things were more or less in place, but somehow it's told. 
I'm sure it's not to totally dead. That's somewhere along the line, we will get the funding to continue the program. As a nation waits to see the fulfillment of the remain promise, the mentally challenged on the streets will perhaps remain, and the fears of many will also perhaps remain. I am Hannah Odami for Joy News. Matters worse, the Auditor General is revealing tonight that uh, there's a nationwide shortage of essential medicines for treating mental health cases. My colleague uh, Michael Papania Shale joins me in the studio with more from the Auditor General's report. What more are we learning from this report? So, Evans, the audit report says that at the time that they had gone there, they realized that the mental health units of the various facilities um, did not receive the necessary medications for treating medical health cases. It goes on to say that. The central medical stores could not provide the requested quantities of psychotropic drugs to the three main psych uh, psychiatric hospitals. And you know them, the Accra Psych Hospital, we have Ankafu Psychiatric Hospital, and then Pantan Hospital. Now, this shortage, the report says, led to community psychiatry nurses at municipal and district hospitals prescribing medications for patients to purchase from the open market at their own cost. Additionally, any drug not supplied by the central medical stores and not covered by the National Health Insurance Scheme was sold at a relatively higher price than the original cost. Mm. And this is exactly what the report found. Are there any recommendations? Yes. Yeah, so, Evans, there were two recommendations actually gave them. It says, well, first, they should collaborate. That is the mental health authority should collaborate, I beg your pardon, collaborate with the central medical stores to distribute psychotropic medications based on patient turnout at treatment facilities. And again, he asked them to collaborate with the ministries of finance and health to improve procurement processes for acquiring psychotropic medicines. Mm. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Papa. And uh, we will uh, delve a bit more into the Auditor General's report because there's been so many revelations in there. Uh, the recent one just released. Uh, George Raffi, in the meantime, is joining me with the latest from the world of business. Hello, George. Alarming numbers from the Ghana AIDS Commission, indeed. Interesting. He says the, 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 the Ghana AIDS Commission boss just told me a short while ago that out of the 100,000 people walking about, not knowing they have HIV, is but they indeed have it and spreading it mm. knowingly, majority of that number are men. Mm. And then the reverse is also that there are now more women engaging in unprotected sex and contracting it because it's easier for a woman to get it. So this is a toxic mix. It's a, it's a ticking time bomb. And, and the, 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 the interesting bit is those who know that they have the disease or they have the virus and deliberately they see it as, you know, a punishment and therefore they want to uh, spread it because they feel that they've also been infected by someone who deliberately knew that he or she had that virus. And that for me is a serious thing. Mm. And for some who cannot abstain, you know, the critical thing is about abstinence, about protection, protection, and protection. And that's a very critical thing. You're right. What do you have in the headlines? Well, Evans, coming up, more oil marketing firms increase prices at the pumps, a development that could influence commercial drivers to demand an adjustment in transport fares. And government justifies more than 20 billion Ghana cities cuts in total spending for this year, insisting further cuts could hurt the economy. The Business News on Newsnight is brought to you by MTN Business. Welcome to the new world of business, Alliance Life and Ghana Pay. To eat, just Momo it. Tired of the long queues in the supermarket? Pay with Momo. When you really want that beautiful new blouse, just Momo it. When you want to get a trim and get fresh to impress you know who, just Momo it. When you need to pay your utility bills and domestic staff, Shani Momo. When you want to send love to the family back home, send some Momo. Join the millions of MTN Momo users all over Ghana and live life the brighter way. So just Momo it. MTN. 
son. We are so proud of you for setting up this hospital. I really love those hospital beds and waiting chairs. By the way, did you import them? No, Dad, I didn't. I actually got them from Kindle Books and Stationery right here in Ghana. Wow. We also bought our office supplies, safes, executive desks and chairs from Kingdom, and they gave us expert advice on how to set up our office. Guys, that makes three of us. I also got our sofa and bedroom sets, plus our dining hall furniture for our new home from Kingdom. Wow, Mom, that makes four of us. I usually get my stationery items from Kingdom, and my teacher also mentioned that our classroom furniture was provided by Kingdom. So there you have it. Whenever you're thinking about setting up an office or acquiring furniture for your home, etc., Kingdom Books and Stationery should be your first point of call. With over 40 years experience in the industry, we stock and supply a wide variety of globally sourced office and home furniture, stationery and equipment. Visit our head office, Osu Akwaje, or our office near the Osu Stadium. We're also in Tema Community 1, opposite Olam SHF, Kumase K and USD Campus, UCC Cape Coast, and now at the Marina Mall, Airport City. Or call us 0302-764101, 764209, or 762792. Visit our website, www.kingdomgh.com. Do you know Flamingo Paint has superior properties than any other paint brand on the market? Listen, when you take one bucket of Flamingo Paint, it's equal to several buckets of any paint brand on the market. So, Flamingo has superior hiding properties, superior coverage, it means it covers, and superior durability. Flamingo paint, superior hiding. Flamingo paint, superior coverage. Flamingo paint, superior durability. Flamingo paint, simply superior. No matter your water needs, Syntex has it all. Syntex tank was first to introduce double layer tank, and now you can have as many layers as you want. Syntex tank was first to introduce white inner layer tanks in Ghana, and now introduces the customer specs order, which will let you order any color and size you want. Syntex tank gives you the biggest warranty of seven years, which no other tank gives you. So whatever your water consumption, size of project, or demand, choose Syntex tank. Syntex tank, stress-free. Syntex tank, reliable. Syntex tank, maximum guarantee. Call 0244-335-168, Kumasi 0505-555-666 or visit SyntexGH.com. Syntex Tank, a year strong, a year tough. Whether I'm passing by the food market, visiting the salon, or filling up my tank for a spontaneous adventure with old friends in a new city, when asked, cash or card, it's always card for me. I switched from cash to card for all my payments with MasterCard. Now I get to do what I enjoy with ease. Switch from cash to card for all your payments with MasterCard. MasterCard, the secure and convenient way to pay. I'm off way! Yeah, <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Pepsodent ever and a Pepsodent taco. I paid here. You're going to natural. FDI, I'm going to get to you. Welcome back to Business on Newsnight. Now, more oil marketing companies are increasing prices of petroleum products at the pumps. But what could be the impact of this on inflation and transport fares going forward? There is more in this report. In the morning, our checks showed that only one oil marketing firm had increased the price of petroleum products at the pumps. However, a fresh round of market scan in the afternoon showed that more players have also reviewed their prices. This includes those that control more than 50% of the market. One can talk about Shell, Total Energies, market leader Goyal and Star Oil. Analysis of the numbers showed that it has gone up by more than 4% to reach 12 cities, 45 pesos per litre. The concern for many now is the possible impact of this development on prices of goods on the market 
as well as transport fares. This is because this is the second time running that prices have gone up in just two months. There are also concerns about the margin of increase, which might have gone beyond the 10% mark that is required to trigger negotiations for transport fares to be increased. Inflation rate have gone up over the past two months and there are fears that it could push inflation rate further in the coming months because of the impact of transport fares. And that is a business tax report. Now, government has justified the more than 20 billion Ghana cities cut in total spending for this year. It has however maintained that further cuts could hurt the economy badly in terms of spending in critical areas. Information Minister Kojo Ponkuma maintained that there's still some need for some sacrifice to help firmly stabilize the economy. Can you afford to reduce anybody's salary in the public sector to its disadvantage or to let them go home? I think that would be a difficulty uh, to do. Item number two, you'd have to deal with statutory payments, which are matters of law, a percentage of re total revenue. You've seen the pain that people have gone through when it comes to debt rationalization and uh, how they have objected to various parts of it. Go to goods and services. My ministry's communications budget is 600,000 CDs for the whole year. Even out of that, we were given 200,000 CDs so far. So ministries, departments, and agencies will tell you that they are not receiving the goods and services allocations, even as promised in the budget. That's the reality on the ground. That's the reality on the ground. So which area can you really cut? These are the genuine conversations that we should have as a republic. Information Minister Kojo Opon Nkrumah. Now, government says it has... No, but the Bank of Ghana says he has put in place the required structures to ensure that it remains policy solvent and will be able to deliver on its primary mandate. Now, this is coming after I recorded more than 61 billion Ghana cities notes in a negative equity position. Philip Brodotu is the Director of Research at the Bank of Ghana. Whether the bank will continue to be policy solvent. Um, it's an issue of policy solvency. And with policy solvency, the issue is whether we can continue to discharge our mandate uh, uh, of pursuing price stability and uh, financial stability despite the negative equity. And the answer is yes, we can. So we can do that. Policy solvency requires to realize revenues to cover costs and build longer term capital reserves. But I think that is not to say that, um, yes, we don't need to recover. We will have to recover uh, as, as, as we move along. But uh, will we be policy solvent as we move on? I think, yes, we will be policy solvent. But again, we also need to recognize that we are putting in place uh, steps and actions to ensure that we return back to to, to positive levels. Philip Abrodotu is Director of Research at the Bank of Ghana. President of the Ghana Institute of Procurement and Supply, Simon Annan, has indicated that procurement industry is playing a critical role in helping government realize its industrialization agenda. He was speaking at an MOU signing ceremony between the Ghana Institute of Procurement and Supply and the Ghana Institute of Management and Public Administration and procurement supply chain will move Ghana from where we are to the next level. What it means is that the government procurement that we're doing, it is what you're going to use to promote industrialization, promote the SMEs, and ensure that there's value for money. And I have maintained that Ghana's socioeconomic development agenda cannot be achieved without appreciation of the role of procurement in our national discourse. Simon Annan is the president of the Ghana Institute of Procurement and Supply. The earnings of telecoms giant MTN continues to hit record levels. Now, this was after its half-year profit before tax reached 2.4 billion Ghana cities, up by 26% of what it recorded for the same period last year. Total revenue for the first six months of this year reached 6.1 billion Ghana cities. It have paid 2 seven billion Ghana cities in direct and indirect taxes to the state. Well, to the stock market, it appears MTN's good run in terms of financials is impacting on its share price on the Ghana Stock Exchange. It went up by 12 pesos today to close at one Ghana city, 
55 pesos at the end of trading on the Ghana Stock Exchange. And that's all uh, for business on Newsnight. Back to you, Evans. And Mr. Nsako is on today. PM Express, right? Business. Yes. It's not business edition, but PM Express. Yes. I mean, <laughs> yes, he is he's on indeed. And there's something he's been saying that's uh, got a lot of people talking. And we've been, uh, you know, playing part of the interview on, on social yeah. media, on our many yeah. social media yeah. platforms. Yeah. And yeah. it's got many people reacting. Mm-hmm. Remember that he's a former executive vice president of Unilever. Been uh, working in the group, exactly. you know, and being on the ground and experiencing exactly. the issues when it comes to, you know, relating to the market production and manufacturing. Dr. Kwame Nkrumah had made that very famous declaration that a black man is capable of managing his own affairs. Always. Well, he's been giving his thoughts on that as far as Ghana is concerned. Listen. Well, it's, I leave it to everybody to make up their mind. I do know that when he stood at the old polo grounds and he said that the black man must show to the world that he's capable of running his own affairs. I do not believe that Ghana in 2023 today fulfills that brief. If there's somebody who believes that it does, I'd like to see the person put up his hand. And I've spoken to many people. Some of them were students of that generation. Some of them were young people who were working. I like to sit with much older people who have seen it all. They've seen Ghana unfold and and come through. And I asked them all the time, I said, is this what you expected? And almost universally, the answer is no. Well, he says the solution is what he calls a mindset revolution. The youth of today are no different from the youth of any era. They too want better conditions. They want to live a better life. They want good housing. They want good food. They want good clothes. They want sanitation. They want good health. They want education, etc. They want to get married, have a family. And it is these concerns that drive people. Che Guevara himself said the revolutionary is driven by love. So this sort of empty militancy, people just go, he says a, a, a revolutionary is driven by love. It is a, wi- a willingness to see society become better. That drives a revolutionary, not the sort of empty wildcat orientation towards violence and so on that we've come to associate with, with the word. That's why Fidel Castro, people don't read the book for yourself, describe Jesus Christ as a revolutionary. So when you're talking mindset revolution and so on, which you say we will, we will come uh, to... What is it, by the way? What, what is mindset revolution? Amilcar Cabral and many others famously spoke about... Amilcar Cabral said the first dimension of revolution must necessarily be cultural. Because when you wake up and you say we need to improve, that is an indictment on your current circumstances. The insight into the condition calls for critical re- reflection and a re-examination of the circumstances that you are in. That is mindset revolution. Well, the full yeah, interview yeah, is yeah, on yeah. PM Express at 9 p.m. It's a fascinating yeah. conversation. We'll all be waiting to looking forward to that. But even th- there's a critical question about whether it's the system or what. Because listen, you meet Ghanaians outside who are managing huge institutions, the World Bank, the Chief of Staff, the Vice President of the World Bank, other institutions, financial institutions, vice president, Citibank, you know, Morgan Chase and all the rest. And these are Ga- the same Ghanaians who struggle to make it here, but they are doing so well outside. So is it the system? Well, tell you what, mm. we talked about that too. <laughs> we talked about that. I asked the question, and I asked it in relation to the current president, mm. Tana Kufado. He's lived, schooled abroad, but the consensus is that he's faced tremendous challenges. Is it that the system just makes it impossible for you to succeed? He has very interesting thoughts on that. Just stay with us at 9 p.m. on the John News channel. It's already on our social media platforms. You can watch it on YouTube in particular. Let's do sports now. And Ms. Bao is here uh, with the very latest. Hello, Ms. Bao. He's been speaking about about the AFCON and uh, also about some players in the Black Star squad. But first of all, on the AFCON, he has emphasized the need for Ghana to qualify for the tournament. 
uh, which is to be staged in Ivory Coast come next year in January. Now, the Black Stars are chasing another appearance at the Continental Showpiece, which is just five months away from now. With nine points, Ghana is in first place in Group E, Angola is in second place with eight points, and the Central African Republic is in third place with seven points. And Ghana will need a win or draw in their last game against Central African Republic on the September 3 to guarantee a place in Ivory Coast, which Hewton believes the team can't afford to miss out on. He's been speaking on UK Baser the station, Talk Sports. We play our last game in September. We're at home to the Central African Republic. At this moment, we're top of the group, but it's quite tight. We certainly need either a win or a draw. So it's a big game for us. Uh, Ivory Coast, of course, is the, the host of uh, AFCON in, in January. And, uh, of course, we very much need to be there. Yeah, so that, uh, is, that's Chris Hutton. Uh, head coach of the Black Stars there. Well, he didn't end there. He also lauded Mohamed Kudus for his skill set and expressed confidence in the midfielder's ability to do well in the Premier League. Should he end up there at the end of the transfer window? I think he's a player that will that will always show interest from clubs. Um, he's young. He has super ability, can, can score a goal. He also has that flexibility. You know, there, there is that question mark on what's his best position. At Ajax at the last season, he was playing predominantly on the right, left foot, he's coming, coming in field. Um, before that was very much as a 10. You know, he's a player that, that can do things on the ball, particularly when the spaces open up in the game. And he has that ability to surge in the spaces and, and can score goals. So no surprise, it's an interest. For me, the most important thing is that he's playing. Uh, I, mean, well, I listened to that interview and mm. part of this also he talks about Hudson Odoi and uh, the Arsenal's player yeah. uh, Eddie, Eddie Kittier, Kittier and his attempts to try and get them to play switch allegiance and play mm. uh, for Ghana mm. and that he says he's been having conversations with them mm. and he's positive mm. uh, about that just that when it comes to Hudson Odoi he's not played as as, as many games as he would want to. Yeah. And that's possibly what he's using mm. to try and get him to play for Ghana. Uh, we'll, we'll hear him later on that. Very yeah, we'll see, we'll see if uh, they'll be able to switch allegiance even before the AFCON in Ivory Coast in January next year. That's all for sports. And of course, just have to mention that Sadio Mane has completed his move to Saudi Arabia. How much? He'll be playing. <laughs> just how much? How much? You don't have that amount. To well, it's, it's in the region of 40 million. That's what they paid Bayern Munich for him. As far as his you know, own salary is concerned, it's, it's it's quite huge. It's quite heavy, you know. Mm -hmm. Huge pocket money. He's been playing with uh, Cristiano Ronaldo at Arnese, so uh, expect some g excitement in the Saudi League come next season. Uh, sports was brought to you by President Hebo and Chaco. President, every smile matters. Mm. Well, uh, I should be uh, trying to play football and, and head to uh, one of those uh, money leagues. Money leagues, that's what they call it, in Saudi Arabia or somewhere else just to make some Good money. So listen to Newsnight here on Joy 99.7 FM. The minority uh, are, uh, in Parliament, particularly on the Works and Housing Committee, say government is acting illegally by going ahead to launch the National Affordable Housing Programme, despite financing agreement uh, still unapproved and awaiting parliamentary consideration. Now, addressing journalists in Parliament today, the uh, former Deputy Works and Housing Minister, Sam Singh described the conduct of government as illegal. Well, today, the uh, government went ahead and cut sword for the $550 million project that will build 14,000 units at Pukwase and Kumasi to be constructed by private players and also in partnership with the public. Now, project consultant Frank Taki says the project has enormous financial benefits for the enclave. This project alone in Pukwase in terms of direct labor on site, we can generate about 250,000 jobs. Then you have the indirect jobs on site, and, uh, and then you have the income any opportunities to the informal sector that is uh, still not accountable. Secondly, when the estate is completed, the economic generation impact is huge, not only within this estate, but beyond. Well, President Kufuado uh, cut the sword and launched the project and says this will reduce the housing deficit. The initiative marks a positive collaboration between government and the private sector as it adopts a different approach from previous government housing projects. 
where government afford funding both the essential infrastructure and the housing units. With this approach, government will provide the land and other essential infrastructure, whilst private sector developers take the responsibility. And that's the President Akufuado there. Now, former Food and Agriculture Minister Dr. Uwusu Priyako says a level of despondency in the grassroots of the governing new patriotic party requires a deep-rooted loyalist to restore hope and break the eight. The MPP will hold the Super Delegates Congress on August 26th to select five aspirants for the November Congress as a selective flag bearer. Now, head of the post, uh, Dr. Friakoto says he has identified the problem. He has a solution to fix it. He is featured in our series, part of our build-up to the Super Delegates Congress. <laughs> According to Dr. Owusu Afri Yakoto, only a strong, formidable, and united front can guarantee electoral victory in the 2024 general elections for the MPP. But he says the current state of the MPP epitomizes despondency and hopelessness due to the neglect of the grassroots. Two things. One is discipline. Two is their situation. Because everywhere you go, inyashi, inyashi, everywhere you go. And you know, in my job, for the, for the six years, in five of those six years, I go around the country. I'm not somebody who sits in the air conditioning in Accra. And I have the opportunity to meet farmers. A lot of them are party people. And they will tell you, yeah, apart from what you've come to discuss about the work on the farm and so on and so forth, they, they complain. Apart from the conflicts, the conflicts are due to the fact that discipline in the party is not, is not enough. So for me, we need to fix this party in order that we can sustain ourselves in power come 7 December 2024. And until that, we are in very serious uh, problem. He's assuring delegates of the party that he will work assiduously to ensure that their welfare is improved when voted to bear the flag of the UP tradition. We have a lot of contracts. Uh, government is the biggest business giver in this country. And if the military can have companies to do business, why can't political parties? We, the ANC in South Africa owns mines, it owns manufacturing concerns, it owns insurance companies and so on. They have to be more entrepreneurial. That's what I'm saying. As a key to all these things about Yenyashi and all that. Mm. We need to, the party as a body should have some business edge to raise income for themselves rather than expect government or anybody to come and finance them. For six years, Dr. Owusu Efri Yakoto led the agricultural revolution under the planting for food and jobs. According to him, Ghana will need a new innovative business model to do things differently if the country is to succeed in diversifying its agriculture. The model, he said, should be driven by government structure, supply chain logistics and market access, support for big data and technology for evidence-based decision-making, research and development. But above all, he said a political will to execute this innovative new business model should never be compromised. Just before we go, a uh, few of your messages on our WhatsApp uh, console now. Uh, Senator from Agonu says, in fact, the Ghana AIDS Commission must continue to educate the majority of youth in the country so that the virus can reduce, he says. Another one here says, Evans, why would any pensioner, in my view as a pensioner, accept a haircut on our investments while the MPP government still keeps huge government appointees, drawing huge allowances and ledgers, still traveling overseas on business class for meetings, which can be done on Zoom, collect per diems, or to start country, uh, Francis says in that WhatsApp message. And uh, this one uh, has no name, but says if 100,000 people are unaware they have AIDS, how did the AIDS Commission get to know? Uh, the one having the disease is unaware, yet some someone sitting uh, in his or her office says he is aware of 100,000 people having the disease. I do not get the logic, he says. And the final one, uh, just before we leave, uh, says, um, and this is um, uh, Mrs. Saki, uh, sending us one uh, well wishes. Enjoy the rest of your evening.